All right. What is going on, boyos? Uh, this time, we did not wait several months to follow up. As promised, we're following up the overhead press tier list uh, with a deadlift accessory tier list. So we're going to attach the same little caveat we have to all the other videos, which is that we are not assessing these exercises solely on the basis of carryover. Uh, because then it would be pretty heavily biased to the things that look really close to a deadlift would be in the S tier and anything that looks less like a deadlift would be in the D tier. So instead of assessing based on uh, direct carryover, we're going to assess on how well these exercises might fit their role within a well-structured training program. So we're going to get straight into it. Um, it's just me today, which is probably good because I added every single exercise you all requested in the community post that I put up. So we got a lot to get through. So probably good. It's just me. Let's get after it. Uh, the first one we're going to put up is going to be a Zercher deadlift. I'm guessing most of you can guess where I'm going to put this. Uh, and then the few Zercher enthusiasts out there are going to be disappointed by where I put this. But we are putting this in the D tier. Uh, it is so unspecific to a deadlift that there's no technical carryover whatsoever. So meaning that it's not likely going to be a good option to fill one of our primary or secondary slots in our goal of building our deadlift. At best, it's going to be more of a tertiary exercise, which is focused on strengthening and hypertrophying uh, muscles relevant to the deadlift and patterns that aren't relevant to the deadlift. So maybe we would be using this as a lower back, maybe a little bit of posterior chain type exercise. Uh, and for the amount of low back fatigue this is costing us, it's probably uh, one of the worst options we could fill that role with. Um, largely the conventional, oh, I should have specified at the beginning, we are talking about conventional here. We can make a sumo one separately because that list would certainly look different for me. But largely when we're talking about a conventional deadlift that's well done, uh, it is a hip hinge at the end of the day. Yes, there is a squat pattern component um, that does matter. Uh, yes, there is an isometric back component that really does matter, but at the end of the day, the true primary movers of a well-done conventional deadlift is going to be our glutes and hamstrings. Um, so a lot of our training economy is going to be dedicated to building these muscles, and I would not use a Zercher deadlift as a very effective means of doing so. The next one we're going to touch on, this is power cleans. I understand the rationale behind this. You think, oh, well, isn't this kind of like a deadlift, but we're really working on that power development, recruiting fast twitch muscle fibers. Isn't that going to be pretty good? And I would say that uh, it's the way that you do the deadlift portion of a clean is pretty substantially different from how you do a deadlift if our goal is to pick up the most weight possible from the floor. Uh, the technique used to get the most weight up to the shoulders is not the same as the technique used to get the most to the hips. So if our goal was deadlift specific power development, uh, a speed deadlift with maybe a little bit greater load than what we could power clean um, would probably be a better option in the case of looking for power development, just because it's, it's developing power in a completely different motor pattern, right? And then you know, I'm going to get this out of the way early. Someone's going to show up like they do every time and say, oh, that's weird. This is in a low tier. But when I added these in, uh, my X, Y, or Z lift blew up, right? And that is a single anecdote. Not to say that your single anecdote isn't legitimate, but there are many reasons why that might have happened. You might just like that exercise. So you tried really hard at it and suddenly trying really hard on an exercise that has overlap and relevant musculature, uh, suddenly your deadlift's going to go up. Maybe you hated deadlifting and just doing something that you hated less was what unlocked the progression. There's so many different kind of multifactorial reasons one thing might have increased a lift. I don't think that's enough to make a generalized statement outward from cases other than just you that it's a good way of building up lift. And while you will see anecdotes on the internet that people's deadlifts blew up when they started incorporating power cleans, I would probably put this in the D tier as well. I'll pro I'd probably put it above the Zercher deadlift just because I really don't buy into this idea that a Zercher deadlift is a great use of training economy when trying to develop a deadlift at all. Yes, it might help because we're using some of those same muscles, but there are so many options better than it. I have no choice but to put it relatively low. Much the same a power clean. Yes, it might help. If it helped, it probably just means that there were some significant flaws with your approach to training before if this was enough to fill a significant gap and drive forward progression, but I digress. Uh, the next one, shout out to Paris, his favorite. We are going to be ranking the seal row. Um, the seal row you know, just a horizontal row with a chest support is going to offer us a pretty unique and helpful benefit in that it gets lets us get in horizontal 
pulling volume uh, without extra fatigue to the low back. So let's say we've done lots of deadlifts for the week. We've done lots of close derivatives of the deadlift that highlight certain technical or strength elements that we need to focus on. More than likely, the reason we can't benefit from doing any more deadlifting after that is the fatigue of our low back. Uh, maybe the fatigue of our hamstrings is pretty close to limiting us as well. Maybe they're not. Usually it's going to be the low back specifically that limits us from doing any more volume. But that being said, we're probably nowhere close to the recovery capacity of our lats. And filling up and uh, additionally hypertrophying the lats on, on top of the work they get from your deadlifting specific work is something that most people find benefit in. Most people find that increasing their horizontal pulling volume has a little bit more uh, of an impact on how their deadlift feels than uh, vertical pulling volume. And uh, they let us do this even when our low back is smoked after we've done all of our more deadlifting specific movements. So um, we're going to say seal rows, and we're just going to group this with any other chest supported row you might have, whether it be a chest supported T-bar row, just a regular chest supported machine. I'm pretty comfortably going to put these up into the S tier. Um, no, they're not just going to suddenly blow up your deadlift. No, they're not working a primary mover of the deadlift even. Um, but the supporting musculature across the upper back, we can kind of run up our volume without interfering with our deadlift training at all. So I think they are awesome. For very similar reasons, we are going to put the hamstring curl up in the S tier as well. Oftentimes, once we've done uh, as much or near as much uh, deadlifting specific volume and it's close variations as we can handle within a week, our low back is limiting us, but our hamstrings could also handle a bit more volume. So we can kind of use this knee flexion based training, whether it be a lying or a seated hamstring to run up and fill up that additional volume in what is one of the most absolutely one of the most relevant muscle groups to a big conventional deadlift. I kind of view these as a very much a why not exercise. Uh, yes, we could get better doing our deadlifts and our deadlifting variations, maybe even some rows moving on, recovering and doing them again the next week. Assuming we select things really well, uh, yeah, we absolutely should and will move forward from week to week or month to month. Uh, that being said, if you just ended each session with some hypertrophy work via a hamstring curl and you grew your hamstrings a little bit more than you would otherwise, I have a hard time seeing that not manifest as more strength in the long run because we do know that hypertrophying a primary mover is one of the biggest predictors of strength. So I have a hard time seeing that not being helpful. And I also have a hard time seeing that getting in the way meaningfully of your recovery from session to session because usually that rate limiter is going to be low back. This is very much a why the fuck not if you have the time. Go after you finish deadlifting, you know, gradually beat the books and progressively overload some volume on hamstring curls and maybe some uh, some seal rows. And it should show up in your deadlift, though it's not going to be this night and day. I was a bad deadlifter till I, tar till I started doing these. Now I'm a good deadlifter. Uh, it's more so going to be, oh, the gains that I was already going to get are increased in magnitude because I also do these things. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is a deadlift stance leg press. You will hear a lot of people swear by this exercise. Um, if we're talking about developing general leg power in the deadlift, it's kind of nice that we can run up uh, that volume and address that physical quality without having to take away from the amount of deadlifting we're doing. Because as we just mentioned, usually our uh, hinging volume is going to be limited by our the recovery capacity of our low back. So it is cool that a deadlift stance leg press lets us train that leg specific pattern of the deadlift with pretty relevant ranges of motion. It's pretty easy to get about the same level of quote unquote depth on a leg press as you would in your conventional deadlift. You get to practice how that would feel from your deadlift stance, which is nice. Uh, and we can do this on top of our real deadlifting, so to speak, without having to take away. So that's a lot of benefits. The reasons that I don't always even include this exercise spot in programs, i.e. in a motion to develop kind of that leg pattern of the conventional deadlift is if someone has uh, another goal, right? They're trying, to they're trying to increase their 1RM deadlift, which is why they're watching this. If they are also training in a even remotely intelligent manner to increase their back or front squat, we're probably getting uh, the majority of the benefits or the majority of what we need to do to benefit from our lower body being strong in so much as we need it in a conventional deadlift. So oftentimes a program might not need these, but if someone identifies that that's something they struggle with and they find that that like position specific practice helps, uh, I can very 
I can very much see these being used. I would put these at the tippity top of B tier, maybe the bottom of A tier. The only reason I don't put it up into A tier is just because that exercise slot isn't always necessary in a lot of programs. If we are uh, squatting multiple times a week and doing our auxiliary leg work to increase our squat, chances are um, we have those physical qualities in the glutes, hamstrings, adductors, and quads needed to break a heavy deadlift off the ground. Uh, I don't think necessarily additional work past just increasing your squat is needed, but they fill that role very well. Uh, the next one we're going to do, kind of the same idea, high bar squats for the development of general lower body power uh, within the deadlift. Uh, increasing your high bar squat, again, it will check that box. Um, does it check that box that much better than the deadlift stance leg press? Maybe you could argue, yeah, it's forcing you to work on your bracing. Yeah, it's a bigger range of motion, so we're going to see more hypertrophy. But I think both of them will get the job done. Uh, the nice part about the high bar squat is most people are already working on developing their squat in the first place. And the high bar is going to help both your main squat, if that's high bar or low bar. And it's also likely going to kind of check that box for lower body development in the deadlift. Whereas I don't think a deadlift stance leg press with deadlift relevant ranges of motion is going to yield you very much carryover on the squat side. So we're going to put this in the A tier. Um, I think you could easily argue for it in the S, but I do think that the, the demands to be a huge conventional deadlifter in the lower body, while they are there, are not, um, I shouldn't say in the lower body, in that squat pattern department. You'll see lots of great, great, great conventional deadlifters who really have underdeveloped quads and not that great of a raw squat. So there is some lower body squat pattern strength that is helpful, but reaching that threshold isn't the most difficult thing in the world. You could look to the success of someone like Kaylor Woolham, who is a mid 900 pound deadlifter and a low 600 pound raw squatter. Um, Yes, that is due to poor leverages. Yes, that is due to a history of knee injury. But the fact that he was able to sumo deadlift that much or conventional deadlift over 900 uh, with that low of a squat is indicative that it's not this absolute necessity that some people would make it out to be. Now, the next one we're going to talk about is deadlift stance box squats. I remember back in the day, George Lehman was always a big advocate of these. Uh, one of the benefits we're getting is what we just talked about with the... Uh, with the deadlift stance leg press that we get that kind of specific feeling of squatting from our deadlift stance. We get some position specific strength out of that. So yes, this might be uh, on a set for set basis better for developing deadlift relevant leg power than the high bar is. Yes, it might even be more uh, helpful on a set for set basis than the leg press, but the problem is that this loads our lower back. It's an axially loaded lift, unlike the leg press, which means that we might have to take away from doing more things that look more like a deadlift to train uh, this quality in leg drive that isn't going to be the limiting factor for most people realistically within a training program. So I don't rate these very highly. I view them as maybe not the best use of training economy because you could just do regular squats in that spot, assuming that's another goal you have or it contributes to another goal you have um, and get similar benefits to your squat and also derive the benefits for the squat. So I just, I don't rate them very highly. That's more within the framework of how I do programming. So don't come after me if you love them. I apologize. But the next one we're going to talk about is the SSB squat. The SSB has a camber that places the bar out in front of you. So it's always trying to pull us forward and we have to resist that forward impulse, just like we do in a deadlift. It places a lot of demands on kind of your thoracic extensor mus musculature. Uh, if we are trying to build up a deadlift and we say, okay, well, I want to make sure I have that general squatting power uh, needed for a big deadlift. Um, I could do deadlift stance box squats. I could do these leg presses. I could do high bars. I would contend that a SSB squat, or I'll probably just put them up there right after this, or a front squat, if our only goal was deadlifting, would be the squat I would do. I would probably pick one or both of those uh, for a couple of reasons, right? The SSB, like I said, is going to be challenging that mid thoracic extensor musculature, which is really helpful for having a big pull. Um, it places additional demands on your kind of trunk area, begin because it's trying to fold you up the whole time. Lots of people will find that doing these to pins really helps the feeling of power off the ground within their deadlift. All around, I just think that the, most people see good returns uh, to their deadlift specifically when this is their squat of choice. 
Similarly, where is the front squat? These images are so small on my screen that this is very difficult. Uh, I can't see it. Maybe it'll come up. Maybe I forgot to add it. If I did forget to add it and it doesn't come up, uh, just assume I'm putting that up there in the S tier uh, next to the SSB squats. Not that they're the best squats in the world, but that they are really effective squats if our building up our deadlift is uh, a big goal. The next one we're going to look at would be the barbell hip thrust. Uh, arguments for this exercise would be kind of similar to the hamstring curl, kind of similar to uh, the seal row in that we're able to run up non-axially loaded so we're not fatiguing our low back hip hinging volume. Isn't that awesome? Um, and I would say that yes, cool, we can hypertrophy our glutes. Maybe in the long term, we'll see some benefits from that. Kind of the same argument that could be made for the hamstring curl. I would just tell you that in my anecdotal experience, it doesn't seem to set you up for the same amount of future success as some equivalent options. Uh, I just think that that motor pattern is different enough and it's building physical qualities separate enough from what is required for a big conventional deadlifter that for most people, yes, this does check that box of hitting some posterior chain volume after you finish squatting or you finish deadlifting. I would just say that for most people, as far as what's going to improve how your deadlift feels, a back extension is just going to be a better option of this in terms of running up additional posterior chain volume. Uh, because it is very logical in that glutes are one of the primary movers. We're just running up some glute hypertrophy volume afterward while sparing our low back. Based on logic, I could not put this below the B tier, though it's not something I will utilize very frequently in my programs at all, which brings us to a back extension off of a 45 degree back extension or off of a glute ham raise. Uh, like I said, same logic as the, uh, as, the glute, as the glute hip thrust, but we're also doing a lower scale stimulus for our lower back and also getting in some very solid hamstring stimulus. So that way, rather than just training, okay, we're just training the glutes here, we're just training the hamstrings here, we're doing this as more of a holistic uh, posterior chain hypertrophy exercise after we finish up our real deadlifting volume. Lower back can generally handle these um, pretty comfortably. I feel very good putting these up into the S tier. Uh, I just find that they're very much in that why not exercise kind of thing alongside the uh, the hamstring curls. Uh, this brings me to a weighted hold at the top of a back extension, as is frequently done by weightlifters. Uh, this kind of shifts the emphasis more to maintaining thoracic, or not thoracic, just whole spine extension. So it becomes more of a spinal erector exercise when we're doing an isometric hold like this, uh, as opposed to doing reps where I find it to be more of a posterior chain hamstring glute stimulus. Um, these can be good, though there are very taxing on the spinal erectors, and I would push anyone that's doing these and working really hard on them, well, if you can do these, couldn't you have done more deadlifting? Maybe we would derive more benefit from something a little bit more specific with this uh, pretty hefty um, spinal erector fatigue that were being posed by this exercise, and most of the time I would, I would kind of push that angle myself. That being said, they totally are fine. I probably would put these at the top of C tier. Um, they can work. If you like them, they'll work. You might even have uh, special training accommodations specific to yourself uh, that, that make it very necessary to do these and you benefit from them. Uh, so I'm not going to, I'm just talking in generalities as per usual. Uh, the next one we're going to touch on would be uh, this one I think was supposed to indicate to me dead hangs. Uh, as far as where we put dead hangs, I think that they are an awesome grip training stimulus uh, because they are not neurally taxing in the way that lots of other uh, things that we might do to build up our grip strength would be. Uh, if we did heavy, heavy rack holds, if we did heavy farmer's carries, we're having to deal with enough global fatigue uh added by these exercises that they, it starts to impact our ability to train other things. Whereas something like a dead hang or even a weighted day, dead hang is easy enough neurally uh, that we don't have to change a lot about our program to fit them in there. Um, if you have a grip problem, these are very much in that why not category. If we want that grip problem to go away, uh, this can be a very solid option. That being said, I always tell people if you have a grip problem, the first thing I would try is the same grip program I've seen work 
probably dozens and dozens and dozens of times now, which is every time you hit a working set on the deadlift, hit a five count static hold before you put the weight down. It's highly specific. It doesn't require any significant changes to our training program. I mean, it couldn't be any more specific. And often, uh, oftentimes that's enough shift in how much grip exposure we're doing per week to suddenly take someone who had a consistent grip issue and make them so they have no grip issue at all. So I would try that first, but if you still have a grip issue on top of that, this fills that role probably about as well as any exercise I could possibly think of. Uh, the next one we are going to take a look at, hanging leg raises. Uh, most people find that training antagonistic muscles uh, at the very least makes their lift feel a little better. They can, they've got a better feel for flexing their abs in the bottom position. Some people anecdotally will report that their back feels better with the inclusion of some antagonistic training. So just like if you might uh, put rows or pull downs after you bench or overhead press, it does make sense to do the opposite of a hip hinge after you deadlift. If you subscribe to that ideology, a hanging leg raise is going to be that ab and hip flexor volume just as well as any other exercise is. Uh, fits in some extra grip work, which can always be helpful. I think they check that box just as well as anything else does. So I'll put these bottom of S tier, uh, I'll, put them, I'll put them A tier, only because I think that, uh, I'll put it there, uh, only because I think that a, uh, a GHD sit up gone out to parallel and then come back up would probably be an even better option as far as training a pure reverse hip hinge, kind of building up the hip flexors, also building up that isometric ab strength of maintaining that locked down rib position. I would say that there's just some proprioceptive benefits to the GHD sit-ups that maybe the hanging leg raise doesn't offer. Um, it appears that it did not load in, but if I had a uh, GHD sit-up in here, imagine that is up in the S tier uh, very comfortably so. Um, let's get into the next one. Stiff leg deadlifts. So here we have a little picture of Dan Green doing them off of a deficit. When we say stiff legs, we mean dead stop to the floor, uh, hips relatively high. Knees don't need to be locked by any means, but they should be noticeably stiffer than how you do your regular conventional deadlift. Much like a close grip bench uh, in terms of strength training often should just be called a closer grip bench because yes, it's not as close as a human could do, but it's closer than what you generally do. And it's enough to be a different training stimulus Stiff leg deadlift, much the same as a stiffer leg deadlift. If the loads are significantly different, uh, like when I do mine, people say, well, you still have a bend in your knees. Well, that's about 100 to 200 pounds off of uh, what I would be hitting on conventional deadlifts for that same rep range. So I'd say it's different enough. Uh, the deficit is going to be present if you have the mobility. If you don't have the mobility to do, go to a deficit, it would be to the floor. And if you didn't have the mobi mobility to do a good stiff leg uh, to the floor, you could even do them off of blocks. I don't think that makes the exercise bad suddenly. It's just accommodating it to your current mobility levels. These are one of my go-to uh, accessories to give conventional deadlifters. I will put this up at the top of S here. The reason I love doing it is because A, it takes some load off the bar. So while someone might get wrecked if they try to do two conventional deadlift days per week. If they make one of, a, one of them a stiff leg day, shift that emphasis towards the posterior chain a little bit more, take a lot of load off the bar, suddenly they're able to recover from it. And a lot of people, if you watch them deadlift, uh, they try to squat the weight up too much. They round at the back. All of these are symptoms of having an underdeveloped hinging pattern and hinging strength. And the stiff leg deadlift is a very, very, very specific way to address hinging strength with the deadlift. We're still holding a bar in our hands. We're still working our grip. Uh, we're still packing our lats the same way we would in a regular deadlift. And we're just shifting the emphasis towards developing that hinge motor pattern uh, that many people lack. They're an awesome exercise. These are my bread and butter for building up a conventional deadlift. The next one we're going to talk about is a shrug. Um, I think... Long story short, I think that if you deadlift really efficiently, traps are not that important because we're not needing to shrug the weight to lock it out. If we didn't give up our positions off the floor, we kind of locked in a good back position and we moved the weight primarily with our hip hinge. Uh, at the end of the lift, all we need to do is we need to squeeze our glutes through and the lift is done. We don't need to sh necessarily shrug the weight through the lockout to get it done. So you'll see that some of the guys with the biggest traps from deadlifting maybe have some of the less efficient form out there. One of the uh, go-to examples I always think of is Dexter Jackson. Uh, big deadlift, big traps, not necessarily the best way I would teach the deadlift. Um, all that being said, uh, I think 
that they're not a bad use of time. They can be a good way to sneak in some grip training. I just think that you'd probably be better off shifting your emphasis more towards your lats, more towards doing more specific deadlifting work, some antagonistic muscles, and then focusing on the posterior chain. Uh, if we have that time and training economy, sure, why not? It's not going to hurt your result, but also I think there are better uses of your time. We're going to put that in the C tier as much as I do love shrugs. Uh, the next one we're going to take a look at is block pulls. Uh, for most people, uh, the bottom position is going to be the mechanically hardest position. We should try to challenge that most difficult position in just about any variation we do, uh, especially people who miss at lockout. We're generally missing at lockout because we fudged our positioning off the floor to get the weight moving, and then we have to unfudge it at the top. So a block pull would not be a very effective way of training and fixing that quality because we're just removing the part of the range of motion where we were messing up our form in the first place. A pause deadlift would probably be a better solution to that missing high up in the deadlift uh, issue. That being said, uh, block pulls for strongmen are necessary because we're asked to train or we're asked to compete from varied heights. So being good at pulling from varied heights is a necessary skill. Uh, and then the other place that these shine is for people who don't necessarily have the best deadlifting leverage. The amount of volume they can handle on a week to week basis is pretty low. Um, doing block pulls and often these people will be weaker from the blocks as well. That's always a good sign that it might actually be a viable option for you. If you're pulling a lot more off the blocks, Maybe not the best call. If you're pulling the same or less off of blocks, maybe this could be viable for you. It can be a way to fit in some more deadlift pattern work um, without just exceeding the recovery capabilities of the lower back. I'm using block pulls myself right now, but that is specific to people who have very limited recovery capacities for specific deadlifting options or maybe super heavyweights who have a less efficient start position. So it's going to beat you up uh, that much more. But that being said, many, many, many people don't have this necessity and would be better off doing more pulls from the floor and mastering that most difficult mechanic of breaking a heavyweight dead stop off the floor without letting your positions compromise. So we'll go top of B tier because when they're called for, they fill that role absolutely very well, uh, but they're not always called for. The next one we're going to look at, uh, Zercher squat. Um, I don't know. Yes, it'll develop some the general lower body power that we're looking to get out of any of our squatting variations. Uh, I think it's a little self-limiting. Um, we're not getting that cool, extreme kind of thoracic extensor demand that we'll be getting from the front squat or the SSB squat in the S tier. Um, I don't know. I would probably put these kind of akin to the deadlift stance box squats. If you like them, they'll get the job done and people tend to work hard on stuff they like. Absolutely. I'm not going to tell you it doesn't work. It just wouldn't be my first choice when coaching. Um, the next one we're going to look at is going to be Atlas Stones. Very, very similar to the Zercher deadlift. Yes, we are training our lower back. Yes, we are training our posterior chain. But that doesn't mean that there aren't a million options that are better. So if we, if our goal was to write a program to maximize our deadlift, I would never put stones in there. Uh, is training stones something that could hypothetically help your deadlift if you're a beginner intermediate lifter just by getting that extra training volume? Sure. Um, yeah, no, I just I, I can't see it. There's not really a good good argument I could make in for including the Atlas stones with the primary goal of increasing the deadlift. I, I tried, I can't do it. Uh, the next one will be calf work. Uh, I think for some people, if you've got good leverages, oftentimes people with good leverages, longer arms, uh, will be pulling from more of a vertical shin position, especially if they got longer femurs, uh, in which case ankle mobility really doesn't matter. Uh, and they'd be useless. Some people like myself, maybe who have to get down a little further because our arms aren't so long, there's going to be a little bit more forward translation of the knee in your start position. Maybe there's going to be a slightly more distinct squat pattern uh, to your deadlift just because you have to go down a little further. In which case, I do think many people uh, underestimate the ankle mobility demands of a conventional deadlift for those people. Uh, if you're training your calves regularly, through a full range of motion, emphasizing the stretch, chances are you have the range of motion needed for a deadlift. So yeah, maybe you could make an argument that just like, hey, these are a box check. If I have these in there, my ankles stay mobile. But so many people are nowhere near ankle mobility interfering with their deadlift. I'll put these at the top of D tier because I do them. But again, that might just be specific to uh, me. The next one we are going to look at 
is going to be the cable pull through. Uh, as far as throwing it in there as a hypertrophy exercise, I think we run into loading issues pretty quickly. If we were going to say, hey, this is kind of like the back extension, the hamstring curl, uh, the hip thrust for additional posterior chain volume once our lower back is smoked. Um, if you are at a level of strength where a regular cable machine offers you enough resistance to do these in reasonable rep ranges, they're awesome. They're standing. They kind of offer a lot of teaching benefits, which is where we're going to get into next. Realistically, lots of people are too strong for these to be a viable hypertrophy option a lot of the time, but they're a wonderful motor patterning tool for kind of teaching people what hip hinging with the posterior your chain feels like. Uh, if someone really is always rounding their back and they never are opening through the hamstrings and learning to hinge at the hips, push the hips back. Uh, one of the first teaching tools I'll throw at them is a cable pull through. So they're an awesome teaching tool. They're an awesome motor patterning tool that you can throw into your deadlift warmups. If you're someone who maybe underutilizes the glutes at the lockout, or maybe you are someone who uh, is kind of a round back deadlift, who's trying to get into more flat back deadlifts and you want to establish that more, more pure hip hinge pattern, throwing these at the beginning of the workout works wonderfully. We'll go bottom of seats here because it is just a learning tool. Uh, and a learning tool that could be substituted for a whole lot of other things, but they get the job done quite well. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is going to be a good morning with a straight bar, or as I prefer, a uh, SSB. The SSB is going to take any uh, fatigue. This might be transferring to your wrists, elbows, and shoulders uh, away. It's going to challenge your kind of thoracic extension, mu extensing musculature more. Uh, it's going to increase the demands on our trunk by shifting that bar position upward all around. I just think the, SS, the SSB good morning is a better accessory for deadlift. So we're going to say we're using an SSB, though it could be done with a straight bar if you don't have the SSB. Uh, it takes away, unlike an RDL, we don't have this ability to use our lats and keep that weight in close to us, right? And maybe decrease the demands on our lower back. So we don't, we take away our ability of our lats to kind of shelter our low back, so to speak, and really forces us to develop a good bracing mechanic, good all around trunk strength, good low back strength. Lots of people will find that this is a great, great accessory to their deadlift. The only knock against it is that it is less specific than a stiff leg, than an RDL is. So there's kind of some practice of, uh, breaking something from a dead stop that we don't necessarily get. There's kind of some practice of tensing the lats that we don't necessarily get. Um, though these could be done to pins to help you work on like bracing from a dead stop. All around, they're a very good general development tool. Uh, the only problem is because they are taxing on the lower back, they do take away from our ability to do something more specific. But they are a potent enough uh, general development tool and they really put some strength under your midsection. Um, I'll put these bottom at A tier. I, I think they are a very good exercise. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is going to be the Ed Cone or Kaler style row, where it's almost a deadlift row hybrid. Not like a full Rubish row where we're cheating and jumping our chest towards the weight at the top, um, more of a controlled tempo um, deadlift row hybrid. It's a good general development tool for a little bit of posterior chain, a lot of lower back, a lot of upper back. So if you identify that's something that's lagging within your deadlifting musculature, um, treating this as almost a secondary option, this is almost a deadlift variation, especially in the fatigue that we're looking at uh, in the low back, it very much kind of programs like a deadlifting variation. If you identify that like upper and to a lesser degree, lower back is a limiting factor within your deadlift, these do great. I just find a lot of the time people use a lot of their lower back recovery economy on the uh, upper back when really that should be directed more towards a hinging pattern and a stiff leg, um, back extensions, good mornings. That being said, if you have identified that upper back and mid back and low back weakness, uh, this will put slabs of muscle on your back and it, that muscle feels very relevant to when you go to deadlift. So we'll put this bottom of A tier. The only real drawback is how taxing this is on the low back, taking away from uh, some more specific training or more sets of deadlifting that we could be getting in. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is a deadlift against bands. Um, I think you used in moderation and with moderate band tensioning. One of my favorite things about this is that we can kind of shift the muscular emphasis to the glutes. 
uh, make that a little harder. It's something I wouldn't do for extended periods of time with heavy resistance because I see a lot of people will start altering the technique they use within their pull uh, to make them the strongest in a banded deadlift rather than the technique that they would use to make them the strongest in a regular deadlift. Um, that being said, used sparingly, uh, I think that they can be a cool little shift in muscular emphasis. They could be a good way to get in some extra grip work with that ton of weight at the top. Uh, and then the other benefit I like is they can kind of act as a motor patterning aid in kind of the same way a pull through can in that it forces you to be more conscious about flexing the glutes a little earlier, trying to bring the hips forward, start hip thrusting towards the bar as soon as that knee passes or the bar passes your knee. So they offer a lot of benefits. They also are not my first choice. Generally speaking, the bottom position is the hardest, uh, and we should be trying to maybe shift our emphasis more towards the bottom position rather than less towards the bottom position. Um, and I think a lot of people are doing these in a misguided effort to fix their lockout. That being said, I think they're perfectly reasonable, and I know smart people who do utilize them from time to time. Uh, maybe go bottom of B, top of C. We'll go top of C. Um, the one, one of the ones that did not load in uh, is going to be a pause deadlift. Please imagine that the pause deadlift is in the S tier. You know what? I'm going to pause this video. I will go get the rest of these, uh, these images. All right. Bada bing, bada boom. We are back. Um, don't remember what I was talking about. We're just going to get into the, <laughs> we're going to get into the next one. Uh, this is a little picture of Andy Bolton. If the accessory was being Andy Bolton, uh, this would be absolute S tier. Very much forgotten as one of the absolute greatest deadlifters of all time. One of only two men, or I guess three men now, uh, to pull 1,000 pounds bare hand. One of only two men to do it with a mixed grip conventional um, done in a suit. Uh, very, very impressive. And one of the hallmarks of his training is more or less speed work. Um, while speed work in general as a principle, I don't think that training power qualities is always the best use of time when what we're really looking for is force qualities. They're different physical parameters. Uh, might be called power lifting, but because there is no significant time component, it really is force lifting or work lifting or something if we're going to get into the physics of it. Um, that being said, I think one of the huge benefits of Andy Bolton style speed work protocols is the amount of practice on first reps it gives you. So that's something I've, I've definitely seen a lot of benefit in, something that Chris Bridgeford, uh, when I talked to him on Instagram a long time ago, mentioned to me as something that he always found helpful for deadlifting was inverting your volume, taking a weight you were going to hit for three sets of eight and instead hitting eight triples, maybe reducing the rest a little bit so it takes about the same amount of time. Um, but that way, instead of three first reps and like very comp specific one RM style reps of the deadlift, you actually end up getting a full eight. Um, lots and lots of benefit to that where you, you don't get a negative uh, to pull you into position when you deadlift. A squat, the second rep is very akin to the first. A bench, the second rep is very akin to the first because we have a negative to set us up. The deadlift, the first rep is very unique and it requires a unique amount of practice. And I think that the old school protocols of speed work when it comes to deadlifting are a phenomenal means of including more technique practice. Um, so I guess when we say Andy Bolton style speed pulls, I don't think the exercise is a, some magical stimulus of pulling quickly, making you super powerful. I think it's more that the programming that comes alongside it offers a lot of benefits. It's not the basis of my training. It's not the basis of how I would tell people to train, uh, but it, it does come with a lot of benefits. And because of that, I'll put it in the bottom of the A tier. Next one we're going to look at is a Nordic ham curl, uh, just more posterior chain volume, kind of akin to uh, the hamstring curl. Uh, problems with these is most people need to get any to get any reasonable volume at all. They need to do the thing where you push off at the bottom, which makes it very hard to quantify progressive overload. So if we're using these as a hypertrophy tool, uh, difficulty quantifying progressive overload is, is something that's a real detriment to it. Yes, it's an awesome strength stimulus, but I don't think that Nordic hamstring curls uh, – have these magical benefits that are extremely unique to them as some people pose them to. I think that most of the benefits that can be gotten from a Nordic hamstring curl can also be gotten from a glute ham raise and can also be gotten from a hamstring curl. Um, and the hamstring curl I tend to favor towards because in its role of hypertrophy, better precision and load control is a benefit. That being said, Nordic hamstring curls are solid. We are going to put those kind of middle of B tier. 
Um, very similar to them, glued ham raises. Unlike a Nordic hamstring curl, we have the ability to move the foot plate forward and backwards, so we can scale the difficulty a little bit better on these. Um, I would say, again, they're kind of filling that role, and because we have a little bit more precision and difficulty control, I would say they outperform the Nordic hamstring curl. Um, maybe underperform the hamstring curl just slightly, but they're an awesome exercise. I do these every week uh, with my deadlifts for my additional posterior chain volume as a home gym guy myself. The next one we're going to look at is a trap bar deadlift. A trap bar deadlift ends up being kind of this squat deadlift hybrid. Uh, if we're talking high handles uh, trap bar deadlifts, I'm putting that bottom of D tier, a uh, bit of a circus lift. I don't think it's a good developmental tool. If we're talking about mid to lower handles on a trap bar deadlift, uh, maybe you could argue that we could kind of use them in the same way some people use block pulls to get in some more deadlift style volume. Um, when our low back might not be able to recover from too much more. Uh, yes, I've seen them be, if you have someone who's a very upper body dominant in their pull, they've got huge spinal erectors, they've got a huge upper back, and they kind of got spindly legs. Um, I think like Steve Johnson back in the day, former 308 pound American record, record holder of the deadlift, he did an off season on the trap bar and came back and hit his best pulls to date. But I think that's a pretty unique circumstance of uh, lower body strength lagging behind um, in which that they could be uniquely beneficial. But for most people, I don't think that they're the best use of time. Most people, it's just ego lifting because with any reasonable practice on it, they're going to be able to lift more than they are on the thing that they actually want to be good at. So we'll just toss that mid seat here because it's not as though it's useless. I'm not going to claim that by any means. Next one we're going to talk about is leg extension. So I guess the idea is we're kind of building that general squatting power, um, that general lower body power that we were looking to get out of our squats, so to speak. Um, maybe we're running up that additional low, uh, we're running up that additional lower body volume without taxing the low back. Uh, but more than likely, if you're squatting at all, knee extensor strength is not going to be uh, the limiting factor within your conventional deadlift. Um, Yes, knee extension does contribute to the conventional deadlift uh, to some degree, but your ability to transfer knee extension force into upward movement of a bar is predicated on so much good anchoring and stability across the whole of your body that training knee extension in isolation is not likely to help your deadlift much at all. I will put these in the D tier. The next one is a snatch grip deadlift. Good strength stimulus places additional demands on the upper back as well as additional demands on kind of the legs in the posterior chain uh, because by widening our grip, we're functionally creating a deficit. We're having to pull from a lower point um, just while also creating a, a greater demand on upper back strength. All around, awesome deadlift variation. Only problem is that it is different enough in stance and it's different enough in grip uh, that technical progression we make on this lift might not always show up in technical progression in our main lift. Um, so yes, we get awesome strength carryover more than likely, but con, we're not likely to get as much technical carryover as we might with another motion. I feel pretty comfortable saying that these are uh, top of A tier. The next one we're going to look at is strict pendlay row. Um, the nice part is about them being strict is we greatly reduce the loads and thus greatly reduce the loading on the lower back, um, which is always a parameter that we're having to work around when we're trying to build up our deadlift. Lots of people find that, it, yeah, I'm someone who misses high at lockout because I fudged my positions off the floor. Lots of people find that the combination of pause deadlifts right off the floor and strict pendlay rows helps them a ton with their ability to start a pull without just yanking themselves out of position. I see success with that a lot of the time. I think these are an awesome motion and I would put them um, alongside the Ed Cohn style row. Different time, and, different time and place for a different goal, but both very, very good exercises. Um, let's see, next one is gonna be a single leg RDL. Pretty good exercise, very good for hamstring mobility and forcing you to use a pure hinge. They offer a lot of the same um, a lot of the same motor patterning benefits of teaching people to use their hamstrings, not just their low back, that we might get from a pull through. Uh, and it's easier to use relevant weights, even when you're a bit stronger, and still derive some hypertrophy benefits of this. So I would put these top of C tier. I would say they outperform the pull through because not only do they act as a cool motor patterning tool, they can be used for hypertrophy. Because balancing is going to be a limiting factor for most people, they're not the best hypertrophy tool in the world, but I would say they're going to outperform the pull through a lot of the time. 
Uh, the next one we're going to look at would be the barbell row, um, kind of mid-range done strict. I would say that much the same as the Pendlay row, strict from the bottom has some benefits. The cone row, so deadlift row hybrid has some benefits. Um, both of those, I think, offer some skill carryover to the deadlift that maybe this regular barbell row lacks aside from bracing. So I would say it's maybe outperformed by those two. But again, it's a great development tool if we identify uh, the upper back is something we want to work on. I would say that for a lot of people, uh, if we're just going to do a strict regular barbell row, uh, we might want to just start moving into using a chest support via the seal rows, via the chest supported T-bar rows, and just spare our low back that fatigue and do some more deadlifting. Um, because the cone deadlift and the Pendlay row offer some unique skill aspects that might make it worth it to do slightly less deadlifting and do those. I don't see that as much from a regular barbell row from the knee. Next one is going to be farmer's walks. Awesome grip exercise. Not my go-to for fixing grip, but they're also very enjoyable. Lots of people uh, enjoy doing these in their off-season to mix things up a bit. Uh, they're going to build up the upper back strength. They're going to build up the core strength to a lesser degree, build up the hip strength as well as the grip strength. So they build lots of physical qualities associated with a good deadlifter. Yes, they are kind of taxing. So it might not be the most efficient way if our goal was only deadlifting, but lots of people do farmer's walks because they want to be good at farmer's walks and derive their unique benefits. And it will also happen to help them build their capacities as a deadlifter. Kind of like the high bar squats, lots of people are going to be doing these anyway, and they have a lots of benefits to the deadlift, which makes them a better exercise in and of themselves. Um, we're going to put these bottom of A tier. Only bottom because if our only goal was deadlifting, I can't say I would probably have someone farmers walk. If their grip was having issues, we'd use that grip protocol we talked about earlier alongside some dead hangs. We likely wouldn't be doing a ton of farmers walks. But in off season, if someone is tired of monotonous powerlifting training, uh, farmers or walks are absolutely something that we can do to break up uh, the training being mundane that will also put us in a better position in the future when our training gets more specific again. So I'm a big fan of those. Rack pulls uh, really depends on the height. If it's above the knee, we're going to put that down in the D tier alongside like the high handle uh, trap bar pull, just not a good developmental tool. If we're talking below the knee, it's just like an elevated height. It's the same as block pulls functionally. I would say block pulls are better a lot of the time because you still get to pull slack and there's some skill components that are more similar to your regular deadlift from blocks. But really at the end of the day, the rack pull is basically the same thing. So we're going to put that right below it, assuming we're selecting similar rack heights to what we would be doing for block pulls. And we're choosing them for very similar reasons of not being able to handle much more or that your sport demands you to be a good um a good puller from varied heights. The next one we're going to talk about, now this one, uh, I'm going to have to give you a little explanation for what this is. Just a picture of Big Laws. He's deadlifting an axle bar. We're not talking about double overhand axle bar pulls, though those are a phenomenal grip exercise. We're talking about deadlifts on the axle bar, or if you pull on the stiff bar, or if you pull on the deadlift bar, deadlifts on the stiff bar. So if you're someone who competes on a deadlift bar or trains on a deadlift bar using either an axle or a stiff bar as a variation, absolutely top tier. It functions as just a small, small deficit because you're taking away that bend you would get from the bar. Yes, you don't get to practice the slack pull, but I find it's a close enough variation that basically every deadlifter I coach, if we feel like we're not going to be able to realistically improve upon their best deadlift bar pull this coming training cycle, like Max, for example, let's say he hits a new PR, but it's a death grind and he's an advanced lifter. We're not going to have enough time to hit an all-time PR on a deadlift bar the next block. We're just going to pull on a stiff bar and aim for a stiff bar PR because we know every single time that sets us up for a successful next training cycle of deadlift bar pulls. It's absolutely one of my go-to variations for anyone that trains or pulls on the deadlift bar is pulling on a stiffer bar as a variation. Uh, it does not go both ways. If you pull on a stiff bar, a deadlift bar as a variation is bottom of D tier, just not a good use of your time. But stiffer bar deadlifts as a variation, top of S tier, very close, very beneficial. I think they outperform the pause deadlift. They outperform. They're awesome. All around, super nice. I would rank them very highly as long as we have those contexts out of the way. Uh, the next one we are going to talk about is going to be... Oh, here's the front squat. We'll toss that up there with the uh, with the SSB because we failed to rank that one before. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is pull-ups. 
Pull-ups are a great upper back development tool. The upper back is relevant to the deadlift. It doesn't load the spine. So again, it's kind of filling that role of additional volume for relevant musculature that isn't you like ta further taxing that limiting factor of the low back. So in a lot of ways, these are very similar to the seal rows. Uh, the only reason I pick, I would put seal rows above these is most people find that if they get stronger on seal rows, there's a different and beneficial feel to their deadlift from getting stronger at horizontal pulling that they don't necessarily get from vertical pulling. But that being said, it's not like the upper back mass you could gain from doing pull-ups wouldn't be extremely helpful for your long-term deadlift progression. So I put them bottom at S tier right below the, uh, the horizontal pull just because it's a little bit more relevant in the positions um, as strength is position specific. Uh, the next one, oh, here's the GHD sit-up that we failed to rank. Putting that up in the S tier, absolutely a part of most well-structured deadlift programs, in my opinion, or at least anyone that I wrote. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is sandbag work and uh, front carries. So pick, load, front carry. Basically the same story as the Atlas stones. Yes, is it going to build up some things that might be helpful for deadlifting? Absolutely. So if you're already doing these, they could be, it's not like it's hurting your deadlift. It's probably helping a little bit. But if our only goal was deadlifting, there are things that I would replace these with in terms of training economy. So we're going to put them there. Um, I don't think they're, they build as many relevant physical qualities as the farmers walk do to the deadlift, where uh, if you do it in the off season, uh, it's going to set you up for a ton of success coming back in the deadlift. But it could, it could serve that same point to just a lesser degree. Next one we're going to look at is a snatch grip RDL. So uh, kind of the same critique of the snatch grip, which is awesome strength stimulus, awesome hypertrophy exercise. It's kind of cool because we're challenging our posterior chain more than a regular deadlift by making it an RDL. And we're challenging our upper back more than a deadlift uh, by taking a snatch grip. So it's almost like, oh, wow, we're making it harder in every way. This is such a good hypertrophy builder or strength builder for the deadlift where we're exaggerating all of these components. And yes, it's a amazing building tool for the physical qualities necessary to be a good deadlifter but there's also it's just so far removed that there's not going to be nearly that same level of technical transfer that being said they're an awesome awesome exercise uh, upper a tier next one is walking lunges uh they're good i mean uh they're a great squat accessory uh, I think if we are doing our work to build up our front squat or our SSB or our high bar or even our low bar, uh, doing more leg volume on top of that is uh, productive for building up the squat, but not maybe the best use of time if our goal was to build up the deadlift. Um, that being said, that glute strength kind of when we're walking in a straight line and our, our knee is going straight out in front of us, we're kind of practicing stabilizing that more closed hip position that we use in a conventional deadlift. There are some benefits to it. We're going to go top of D tier, bottom of C tier, something like that. Next one, kettlebell swing. Um, great kind of conditioning tool that trains relevant musculature, can reinforce that hinging pattern. So I think I would put this kind of right around the pull through in that it's a phenomenal motor patterning tool. You can use it to kind of warm up your glutes, get a light pump so you can feel them in your deadlift a little bit more. Uh, if you're going to be doing conditioning, I guess this could help your deadlift more than other conditioning options would. Um, so if, if that was the goal, it can be done. Andy Bolton always liked them. Um, that being said, they're not the most well-rounded hypertrophy stimulus out there. They're not the most well-rounded strength stimulus, but they could be a great motor patterning tool. And they also offer the benefit of if you're doing conditioning, you could do kettlebell swings and it could be slightly more helpful to your deadlift than any other conditioning might be. So, you know, mid top of C tier, I can see them being used. It's not like, uh, if you succeeded, it was because of these or you failed because you didn't have these. Um, the next one we are going to look at is going to be deficit deadlifts. Uh, they have to go top of B tier or kind of alongside the rack pulls and the block pulls, just an altered height pull. Um, if you watch my video, why I don't program deficit deadlifts, I think I was pretty clear. I'm not telling you they're not going to carry over. I just think that there are better selected options in terms of, um, if we're going to be doing this highly specific tech, like deadlift variation, we should select a highly specific variation that's going to have better technical transference. Um, lots of the physical qualities people are looking for in their deficit deadlifts can be built elsewhere. Um, that being said, they absolutely work. They're a lot like a deadlift. They're slightly harder, 
that if something looks a lot like a lift and it's just slightly harder, there's a good chance it's going to have good carryover. I would just say it's outperformed by the block pull and the rack pull because I think the block pull and the rack pull at least have that context of they're easier on the low back and can be used for people with poor leverages. And that's kind of the one thing that would sneak them in there. Uh, the next one is um, SSB box squats. Uh, I don't like box squats for developing the squat. The one time I would use a box is if it's a deadlift accessory. I think that the fact that you're doing it from a dead stop develops some unique strength qualities. Um, the SSB, again, kind of is making you uh, resist the bar pulling you forward the whole time, makes it a little bit even better of a deadlift accessory. But again, that being said, is if we're already training to increase our squat, we don't need these deadlift specific squat variations in the deadlift stance box squat or the uh, SSB box squat. So I'd put these alongside the deadlift stance box squats. Yes, they absolutely work, but I really don't think they're needed if we are already doing um, some other squat training as a, as a separate side goal. Uh, the next one we are going to look at, I'm pretty sure this picture of Alan Thrall was trimmed and it was supposed to say, um, pause deadlifts, in which case right up behind the stiffer bar deadlift variation as a highly specific uh, variation that's going to allow us to emphasize certain strength qualities that we feel are lagging or certain ranges of motion where we feel are losing our position while also yielding tremendous amounts of technical carryover and allowing us to practice the skill of deadlifting more. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is this little picture of George Lehman, and that's going to be like shrug, cheat shrugs, uh, cheaty Yates rows, and cheaty RDLs, kind of the Lehman methodology. And the Lehman methodology, I think I've in the past I've referred to it as kind of the kitchen sink approach of just any exercise you can imagine being a part of a deadlift and aiding you in some way, you do one all-out set. Uh, it absolutely can work. There's tons of people who have built up uh, tremendous deadlifts, deadlifts using roughly the Lehman methodology. He's modified it quite a bit, but Andrew House has pulled 900 plus pounds in competition uh, utilizing this kind of Lehman-based philosophy of one all-out set of some relevant motions. And it's got its pros and its cons. And one of the big cons is when you're only doing one all-out set, uh, A, we're drilling a lot of breakdown in that set if they're done the way he advocates them. Uh, B, we're only doing one set, so we only get one set of practice. So we're not like we're likely to suffer from a technical proficiency uh, perspective as well following this methodology. And then the other critique that could be made of it, it is very much a deadlift only program. It's assuming that we don't have any other goals. Uh, so it's very kind of inefficient with its use of fatigue. Uh, it's not trying to boil down what is needed. It's trying anything and everything you can to increase your deadlift, which if uh, George Lehman had been a full power power lifter that would have hurt his result in the squat because it would have eaten into his training economy for his other lifts so much to just do Hail Mary attempts at everything. So it's not the most efficient use of training economy out there, especially if you have uh, other strength goals that you are trying to develop alongside your deadlift, but it absolutely can work. So I don't know, just going to throw that in the middle. Just wanted to give my thoughts on that in general. I don't know why I just moved the high bar. Lat prayers, uh, straight arm lat pullovers. I don't know when we started calling these lat prayers and not pullovers. Uh, I'm blaming Dr. Mike, though I love him. Um, yeah, they're a good like uh, additional hypertrophy stimulus for the upper back. Um, they're kind of practicing some skills associated with the deadlift, so it can be a good motor patterning tool. I know Max likes to do straight arm pullovers before he deadlifts to kind of practice keeping that bar in close. Um, I would say that they're a solid hypertrophy tool and a better kind of teaching tool and motor patterning tool, which uh, means I would put it above a similar exercise in the single leg RDL. So a better hypertrophy stimulus than the single leg RDL while also being a similarly good motor patterning tool. Uh, what do we got left? Behind the back hack deadlifts. Uh, while it is maybe an impressive feat of strength, maybe it is a terrible de developmental tool. Uh, no, it doesn't like effectively build up the squatting qualities of the squat or the deadlift very well all around. Uh, no, it's, it's got to go below the Atlas stones out of respect. I'm going to put that by the Zercher deadlift. Cool feat of strength to show off on the internet. I got nothing but respect for that, but not necessarily a good developmental tool. The next one is going to be RDLs, uh, very similar to the stiff leg deadlift in uh, 
taking a deadlift, shifting the emphasis towards the hinging musculature, uh, slight downgrade because we don't get to practice that skill of breaking it off the floor from a dead stop each time, but slight upgrade in that it's good for beginners to learn a hip hinging pattern who maybe couldn't do a nice looking dead stop stiff leg from the floor. So I would put these right uh, up there in the top of A tier alongside the snatch grip RDL uh, and the snatch grip deadlift as far as uh, being a very good developmental tool. Um, but I do think it's outperformed by the stiff leg in terms of being a strength builder. Next one, this is supposed to say control the eccentric, so deadlifts with a controlled eccentric. I'm not telling you to do this all the time, but goddamn, for some people, this is a phenomenal variation. Um, very close, just like all the other ones that we've rated extremely highly in the stiffer bar deadlift and the pause deadlift. Again, it's very close, but it's different enough that we're going to shift strength emphases towards maybe the hamstrings and controlling the negative a little bit more. We're going to really tax the low back because we're running up more time under tension, holding this like the position specific to our deadlift. It's going to help us find what our optimal starting position is by doing a controlled negative. All around, top S tier. As you can tell, I like these a lot. Last two we're going to get into. Uh... Off stance work. One of the reasons people like using sumo deadlifts for conventional deadlifters is because it's easier on the low back. It lets them get in additional training volume. Uh, it might be a way to train the abducting musculature. So it's kind of a squat deadlift accessory hybrid. Uh, one of the go-to reasons people will put it in there is just because it's low back sparing when compared to a conventional deadlift, in which case I would pick a block pull over these. Uh, but that being said, I do find there's a lot of benefit to be in beginner to intermediate lifters to do varied stance deadlifting because every time I have someone who's a beginner or intermediate do some off stance work, they learn something about the deadlift. There's something about the mechanics of a deadlift, the brace, the lat pack, the hip hinge, uh, the knee travel. Something about doing the other stance makes something click about what they were doing wrong on the first one. Uh, and when they come back to it, lots of guys who don't understand how lock in uh, extended mid back. Uh, conventional. We'll do a block sumo, understand it on sumo, come back, and they'll be able to do it on conventional. So great teaching tool in beginner and intermediates kind of helps them become a well-rounded strength athlete before specializing into one stance. Um, I just don't think that it's necessarily going to be the best use of time for advanced lifters. So we'll put those up in the mid B tier pretty comfortably. And then the last one, Shout out to Paris. It's the old backwards SSB squat that he loves. I don't love these as much as Paris. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I know on paper it's supposed to be pretty similar to a front squat. I think that the front squat trains some unique strength qualities through the trunk uh, and mid-back that these don't train. So while they are a great uh, quad bias squat variation, I don't think they offer the same benefits to the deadlift that the front squat might. Um, I would say that they're no worse than other squatting variations. I would probably go just toss this alongside, maybe just slightly below the well, the, the deadlift specific squats that we talked about earlier, uh, because at least those are thought out. I don't think they're necessary, but they are well thought out to be well selected squats. So that's all I got for you guys. This is a long ass video. We'll see how long this takes to upload. Thank you for watching.